Hello, athletes and fans of bodybuilding. Tarek El Gindi with the Mr. Olympia. Today, I have here with me my co-host, Sean Ray. Uh, Sean Ray, you are one of the greatest bodybuilders of all times. You knew Mike Quinn. Um, I want you to just tell us a little bit about his history from the beginning. Um, he turned pro in 1987 at the NPC USA. You coincidentally turned pro at the Nationals on that year. Is that correct? Yes, I did. I had a good chance to see Mike as early as, I believe it was 1984, maybe 85 in Pasadena. He competed over in a competition when I was still an amateur, and I got a chance to see him. And I was actually surprised he wasn't as tall as I thought he was, being in the magazines. I think he'd done a few AAU shows prior to that. But in 1987 especially, I was paying attention to him because – that was the year I won the Mr. California in May of 87. And I believe it was in the summer of 87 that Mike won the USA's. A lot of people thought I was going to do the USA championships, but I was holding out for that national title. And of course, I knew at some point my road would collide with Mike Quinn after winning the 87 nationals. Um, and he and I were in the magazines a lot in 1988 because he was USA champ. I was the national champ. And I knew I was going to see him somewhere along the way. And ironically, as fate would have it, we were both training for our first Olympia debuts in 1988. Welcome, Flex, by the way, um, in 1988. And uh, it was in L.A. Mike was training at Gold's Gym. He was training with Robbie Robinson. He was training with uh, Rick Valente. And uh, the, the guy was an animal in the gym. Uh, and when I, when I say he trained like an animal, I mean, he grunted and he slammed the weights and he was very barbarian like in the gym and to be in his presence was like a guy that was looking for a fight. Mike attacked the weights. Mike was, you don't want to look, you don't want to stare down Mike in the gym. Uh, he was very, very known for his back. And by the way, he was off season. He was, he was well over 250 pounds. Mike was known to get heavy in the off season, but as fate would have it, and that, that first Olympia, my first experience, Mike came in as small and as lean as he's ever been. He wasn't gifted with great genetics. His back was his glaring strength. His arms were really impressive. His legs were his weakness. And when he lost a lot of weight, he actually came in his, his first Olympia in 88. I think Mike was on record as saying he was like 207 pounds. And this is a guy that's normally 250 plus. He, in sweats, he looked like he lost everything. And then when he got on stage, he was one of the most ripped and conditioned bodybuilders. And I knew then because he was in such great shape that conditioning, not size, was the game I needed to play if I was going to compete with the big boys. Uh, and Mike ultimately wound up in fifth place, and I was down in like 13th or 14th place. But it served as a good lesson for me because I knew, and people had reinforced, I had better genetics than Mike. I had better potential than Mike. But you can see with Mike's work ethic and his dieting that the dieting and the training got him to where he was. Genetics favored me. The genetics favored flex. And when you saw a guy that had less – uh, it, it makes you pay attention because I knew if I worked harder, I could be better. And, and I drew inspiration off of that from Mike way back in 1988. Very cool. Very cool. We want to welcome Flex Wheeler, four-time Arnold Classic champion, 1992 Mr. USA's Flex. Tell us about Mike Quinn. When did you meet him? What was your experience, the impact that he had on you? Yeah, um... <clears throat> It was in the, um, excuse me, it was in the 90s when I moved finally to um, to L.A. and started training out with Go's Gym. Um, like a lot of us, I, I had the honor in representing Go's Gym uh, internationally. So there was always a, a Go's Gym convention. And that's when, you know, I even remember like our first picture. It was back when I had, you know, Flex Wheeler etched in the back of my head and uh, I was sitting next to Mike. Um, like Sean said, you know, um, very aggressive, you know, very type of in your face. You know, he was definitely one of those type of guys who wanted to try to um, induce that intimidating factor. Um, we got along um, like at a distance. Um, and and, I, and it's nothing I really want to harp on now because uh, the man is gone. And, uh, you know, that that's stories are great. But we, we weren't, you know, we didn't get along the, the greatest uh, I remember he gave me, um, he made the statement about me. He's like, Flex, you're like a chihuahua, and I'm like a pet bull. And I just stared at him like, you know, 
what, what do you mean by that? You know, you, you mean fighting? You know, what, what do you mean as men? And I know I always took it in a, uh, in a negative way. You know, I'm, I always looked at it as if he was saying that I was like a, literally like a physical chihuahua and he was like this intimidating pet bull. And, you know, um, from that moment, we, we really never got along. We didn't get into arguments. It wasn't that type of game back then. Uh, you know, it was about respect. And even if you didn't get along, it was about respect or, you know, you're going to get it in. Um, but I know that always affected me because when he had said that statement about me, I was still an amateur and I was really, really new to Ghost Gym and everything like that. And um, he always reminded me of the type of uh, bullies in my neighborhood, you know, the bullies that I couldn't stand up to back then, but I definitely could when he made that statement. But, you know, I'm honored and happy to say that we met each other again. It was at some event in New York, um, maybe 10 years ago. And, you know, we're both older now, you know, and, and uh, you know, all that was uh, just memories. We laughed, we talked about it and laughed about it. But um, yeah, just what a fierce competitor. Um, you know, and, and like Sean said, you know, the guy was intense. You know, I, I remember, and even Sean, you know, people were saying, you know, you're an intense person. I never looked at myself like that. When I seen a person like Mike, I'm like, that's intense. You know, yeah. I'm just trying to make my way. But, you know, it's just overall, it's just sad. Uh, but we are, right? We are living in those times where we're going to start losing a lot of people, a lot, yeah. a lot of people. If age has anything to do with it obviously tomorrow isn't guaranteed to any of us absolutely none of us but we are you know me and sean and people of our age and in the game we're going to be losing a lot of people really soon probably within you know five or six more years i would probably say at least you know 40 50 more people uh, because they're getting up in that age and it's sad it's sad and it's even more sad that we only really pay true homage to them when they're gone, you know, we need to start recognizing the pillars of our sport um, while they're here and they can still receive those, those roses and those flowers from us. And they can hear that from us uh, instead of yeah. waiting until they're gone. We, we, it's great that we got the Masters Olympia back because that's we can only that. But, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's so easy now. And it is so powerful, so quick. We need to figure out a way to pay homage to, to these pillars to create this sport and, and we could stand on their backs as we built and we became pillars later on. Um, because I, I think the younger generation needs to know where it came from. They don't know crap now. I don't even think they give a damn, you know, the backs yeah, that I, they're standing I, on. You know what I'm saying, I think Sean? I was, I was on to something, Flex, and you're, you're taking me back to where I was on to. You know, when COVID came, it was one of those things where I was just in the middle of doing a lot of where are they nows. I was catching up with those guys and I got up with you. I as remember well. where are they now? And, yeah. and and people people liked it. I think I got lazy. I got a little bit lax because COVID slowed everything down. I couldn't. I was setting up appointments with different individuals and COVID kind of like made everyone pivot and I couldn't get those interviews. But you you take me to a place where yeah, I think it'd be kind of cool to to revisit that because there's a lot of guys out there sitting on the sidelines that we can learn from that have stories to tell and. And, and I like that aspect of our sport that I'm connected with a lot of those guys from the past. So I'm going to ramp that where are they now up um, in honor of Mike. I, you know, I had an opportunity to, to catch up with Mike two years ago wow. uh, and we were right. We were right in the throes of COVID out on the East Coast. I was in Florida and we were going to have this meeting. And of course, we think tomorrow's promise. It didn't happen. And we're going to do it later and later became next year, next year. And now the guy's gone. So I. I feel a little bit remorseful that I didn't pursue that because he he's chock full of stories. I mean, he didn't live a he didn't live a uh, a, a glamorous life. He started right. off pretty glam glamorous in terms of moving to Gold's Gym and doing the bodybuilding, but then he went over to the WBF and he had some problems over there. He lost his sister. He had some drug problems and moved back to home and and he had a lot of injuries, had a lot of pain. And his story is a story that I would have really loved to catch because he he had a lot of things going on. Uh, unfortunately, well, you know we can't uh, capture that. I would sure. love uh, to assist you in that. Um, I would love to assist you in that. I remember when you were doing that, where are they now? And, you know, I was. I, I remember, and I'll be really quick, uh, Tamer, because I know, uh, Tarek, you got to kick my butt for that. Um, I'll be really quick because I know you're about to say something, but 
I remember watching those and I remember seeing the comments and the response and it was just obvious. They were not aware. People weren't aware that you're talking to legends and literally you're talking to people who were, we, we stood on their backs to elevate yep. the sport. And now people are standing on our backs to elevate the sport. And, and you know, it was a little different back then because we were weeder athletes. That was one thing that really united a lot of us because a lot yeah. of us were weeder athletes and we get to see each other at least once right. or twice a year. If not, we all bang that goes Jim Venice. But, you know, it's really sad that that now if you don't have a massive following or a big contract or something like that, you're <laughs> excuse me, you're forgot about. And yeah. I think that needs to happen. You know, no other sport forget about their athletes like like our sport do. You know, they pay homage to them. Uh, and we so, need to do something like that. So I'm going to put it on me and your back, Sean, to make this happen and to keep but, that dream alive. I, I, I'm going to tell you this, and I, I feel comfortable saying this. It's, it has been a while, but I was very close to Sean Road. And um, I, give, I give Sean Ray a lot of credit. The people that don't know this industry, they criticize Sean Ray because he's a very truthful guy. But um, uh, Sean Roden won the Mr. Olympia. And we were at the San Diego uh, Fitness Expo. And Sean Roden... I saw Sean Roden there. He was there with a, a Stanimal. I said hi to both of them. And then Sean Roden went on to do a seminar with Sean Ray. And um, at that point, Sean Roden was on the, on the top of the world. There was no legal issues. There was no health issues. And uh, after the seminar was over, I met with Sean Ray outside of the San Diego Convention. And Sean Ray came up to me and said, Tarek, I'm, I'm concerned. And I said, what are you concerned about, Sean? And Sean said to me, I'm concerned that Sean Roden, who just won the Mr. Olympia, he's on top of the world, just got a big check, that now his goal is to gain more muscle, gain 10, 15 pounds of muscle. And it mm -hmm. concerns me that it could put pressure on his heart. It could put pressure on his health. This was Sean Ray, Sean Ray at the San Diego Expo before Sean Roden had any health problems or any legal problems. And I, I have to tell you, I have the utmost respect for Sean Ray because every time a bodybuilder passes away, like Mike Quinn has passed away, Sean Ray is the first guy to come to me and say, Tarek, I want to speak about it. I want to speak about it. I feel passionate about it. So, Sean, I want to tell you, I, I am not as experienced in the industry as you guys are, but for the people that know this industry, I want to commend you because you are one of those guys that honor more the people that have passed than anybody in this industry. And a lot of times you get angry, you get mad when people compromise their health before it happens and people right. blame you for it. They blame you. They, they, they say you're jealous. They say you are, um, you know, vindictive, that you are negative about it, when in reality, you're trying to protect them before it happens. And I did see that with Sean Roden. Before Sean Roden ever got sick, before Sean Roden ever had any legal problems, the first person that showed concern about his health was Sean Ray. And um, yeah. the first person that reached out to me about Mike Quinn was Sean Ray again. So, Sean, I think you lead the charge in remembering those, and I commend you for that. So yeah, well, I don't... Just for a second, big bro, uh, little homie, younger homie, I can call you younger. Um, yeah, Tarek, you're, you're, you're not as old in a game as I am, but, but regardless of uh, what people say, me and Sean have had our run-ins, man, you know, uh, probably if we were more in a proximity at different times, we would have definitely uh, got into fisticuffs, but uh, to echo on that, Sean is also the only person who has helped so many bodybuilders uh, in business wise. Um, he was the first to help me understand the business. You know, after I won uh, the Ironman and Arnold and all that, you know, he talked to me about guest posing and, you know, even after Olympia, you know, it's like, you know, he's angry at me. And I'm like, why? And he goes, because, you know, you just won. You're going to take a big chunk of the, the, the guest posing. And I didn't really understand that. What do you mean guest posing? You know, but. It's so many people uh, that he's helped. Yeah, you know, uh, Sean is hardwired. 
he's very competitive. You know, um, uh, he 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 has his own way of delivering, and, and sometimes that not that might be uh, not the best way for other people to receive that. But I do think he does come from a good place, and um, I, I will acknowledge what you said. It's more athletes out there that he's helped, and they they probably even aware of it. I remember when we went to uh, Hideo's first show, and we're walking down. You know, we're walking down the streets in Japan or whatever, and he's giving Hide advice on, man, if I was you, I would have had to sign here. I would have done this and I would have done that. And a lot of times when I'm around him and he's talking, I just shut up because I'm listening. That's what I'm like, damn. Listen, man, he was, I didn't think he was about the that. first one. Sean Ray was the first one to reach out to me today and, and, and talk about Mike Quinn. And, and, you know, two years ago, none of us, were reaching out to Mike Quinn, and here's Sean Ray, who gets heavily criticized. He was actually the person that was reaching out to Mike Quinn. So I'm giving Sean Ray a lot of credit because he he usually reach out. He reaches out to the people when they are alive, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, uh -huh. I commend you for that, Sean. I really do. Now I have a question for both of you. Mike Quinn was a very good bodybuilder, but he didn't win any pro shows, but he was very marketable. He had many cover, uh, magazine covers, maybe more than some guys that had won multiple pro shows. Why was he so popular with the magazine, Sean Ray? So again, I came up uh, right parallel to Mike. We turned pro at the same time. Uh, that show I was talking about in Pasadena was the AAU Mr. America at the mm -hmm. convention center and he did win that. And then he went on to win the USA's. Um, I was on tour with Mike and Tanya Knight back in 1989 over in England. And this is when Mike was kind of riding high still off of getting fifth place at the Mr. Olympia when he was at his smallest. And it was just prior to the drug tested 1990 Mr. Olympia that Mike, not only did he pass the test, but he competed in that show and he wasn't at his best clearly. But he had one of the, the loudest responses from the crowds because Mike recognized very early on that he's at a genetic disadvantage and is posing uh, and firing up the crowd and, and coming out there stomping. He was Mike Matarazzo before we had Mike Matarazzo, if you've seen Mike Matarazzo pose. Mike was one of the more popular bodybuilders in the magazines. Mike Matarazzo was one of the more in-demand guest posers. But Mike Quinn was Matarazzo before Matarazzo. He was aggressive on the stage. He had a little swagger to him, a little R&B to him. He posed often to the Gap Band, but he also had that hard driving, you know, like ACDC type music. And he would be in your face with most muscular shots and the back shots and all that. But he was a presence in the gym training with Robbie Robinson. Like you couldn't miss him. You couldn't not not hear him screaming or yelling or dropping the weights or throwing the weights around. We all knew his legs weren't that good, but he would be he'd be in there underneath that squat bar trying to build those legs up very aggressively, very loud. Mike was very popular because when he was not on the stage and he was in the audience, he, he knew how to communicate with the audience. So he was able to survive contractually on his popularity through great photo shoots with Chris Lund, great photo shoots with Mike Nevue over at Iron Man magazine, and then on the tour circuit. He would do those tours. He would do the guest posing. He didn't have to win. I mean, if we're talking about winning and losing, let's be honest. I only won two pro shows uh, and lost one on a, on a drug failure. Um, I made my bones by competing against the best in the Olympia. Mike Quinn, when he saw an opportunity to jump in that Olympia that was drug tested, he rode the wave because then came Vince McMahon and entertainment bodybuilding. And he signed on with Tom Platts and Vince McMahon right after the 1990 Olympia, largely because of his performance at the Olympia. Because if truth be told, I don't know where he placed. You could look it up. But I would have Mike Quinn way at the bottom of the 1990 Mr. Olympia. But he turned around and he inked the deal with the WBF. And he rode that wave of performance into the WBF. Now, again, I mentioned there were some drug issues. They reoccurred. And he never was as good as he was in that 1988 Mr. Olympia. It, was, it seemed to be on a downward trajectory for Mike Quinn. And the WBF contract, uh, the, the amount of time, the, the dead time that he had on his hands, I think was a detriment to him. Because if you got recreational drug issues, the last thing you want to have is a lot of spare time. Mm -hmm. It consumes a lot of your thought process. It takes you places you don't want to go. 
Mike Quinn wasn't the only one. Mike Christian and David Dirt, they had too much time on their hands because there was only one event a year. There was nowhere to guest post. There was no real challenge because he had a fixed contract. Mm -hmm. So I think I think the WBF was to his detriment. Whereas in the IFBB back in those days, he was able to travel the globe. He was able to guest pose. He was able to have cash money. When he had those fixed checks in that one contest, he had too much time on his hand. He survived it, and he went on through the 90s uh, to continually be Mike Quinn. He was a great trainer. Uh, he, he endured the tragedy of the loss of his sister, but it was never the same. I think when he got out of the IFBB and went to the w WBF, I think it was kind of like a downward thing for him, along with David Durth, unfortunately. But I did see Mike in 2011 at the Masters Olympia, and we had a reunion of champions, and it was both mostly Olympians. And Mike was so humble, he didn't even want to be recognized. He didn't want to be on the stage with us. He didn't want to be part of the in crowd. He just showed up. He lived in Florida, and he just showed up. I'm like, Mike, you got to join us. He's like, nah. He was very humble. And if you watch some of the interviews I did with him back in the days, you can see there was two personas. He was, he was like that Boston in-your-face dude that wanted to fight in the gym. But off the stage, he was very quiet-spoken, very humble. Um, you almost had to t lean in to hear him because he spoke at a whisper. But in the gym, you know, you couldn't miss him. So, you know, it's unfortunate that we didn't catch him in these last few years, but I don't think he was very healthy, and I don't think he was injury-free. He, he had a lot of issues. Um, uh, Flex, do you yeah, relate was... to the personality of Mike Quinn? Do you feel like sometimes that could be you as well? Yeah, definitely. I know I, know, uh, I have to be um, um, goal-driven. Uh, I'm not the type of person who can just sit around idle. Um, you know, I'll just have bad thoughts. I had a, you know, I had a very interesting childhood that, that, that I think now people are starting to understand that, you know, mental health isn't a taboo. Um, a lot of us suffer uh, from mental health in various different ways. Uh, obviously I've suffered from it then and I do now. Um, so yeah, even as Sean was, uh, was, uh, you know, talking about Mike just now, You know, it was like that old song, you know, storming my pain. You know, it was like, is he talking about me? Is he, is he, you know, it's like a double sword because it's swing both ways. And the thing about it is, you know, to answer your other question is, um, you know, Mike competed in a hard time, you know, just like in the 90s. Listen, yeah, he was high off of being fit in Olympia. Who's excited about that anymore? Right. right. I'm just being real. If you play fifth in Olympia, you're almost considered like a failure. Yeah. I remember like Ron uh, uh, Ron Love, first time I met him, he was 10th in the Miss Olympia. I was calling every powerhouse in the United States just to speak with the guy. It was an honor. Um, the sport was very difficult back then. I would argue that if Mike was competing in this era, he probably would have won more shows and done even well and made more money. It was just a very freaking difficult time back then it was a hotbed i mean in the 90s those gym was a hotbed for just creating this ex ex incredible talent and let's face it you know in history um bodybuilding fighting football there's always some arch nemesis somewhere who's just as equally talented as you who works hard and that pushes the envelope and that changes the entire level of the game wherever it is rapping music anything and it everybody had to level up because of that. so yeah. we were all leveling up because of that we we're all loving up because of mike um it was just so ultra competitive people don't understand one of, the, one of the things that i can appreciate with our age flex is that we i think we did live in the golden era because we were yeah. connected we were connected to the era that came before us um you know coming up in the mid to late 80s I was connecting with Boyer Co., with Chris Dickerson, Samir Banu, and, and even Franco Colombo down at Gold's Gym, Tom Platts, Dave Johns. I mean, that was a whole different era. Bob John Paris, Brown. Yeah. John Brown. And then, you know, when Mike came out from Massachusetts to do his thing in, in Venice Beach, again, he was, he was coming on the tail end of, a, of an awesome time. And having the privilege to go on tour with him in 1989 in England, I'm, I'm at the top of my game, right? I'm, I'm coming off of the New York Night of Champions and the 88 Olympia. But Mike beat me in that 88 Olympia. So in 1989, the year I did not compete, Mike was the headliner. I wasn't the headliner. 
Mike was the headliner. It was Tanya Knight went on first. I went on second. And Mike Quinn closed the show. And it, it couldn't have been any other way because Mike's performance uh, was on a different level. It was almost like, you know, it was electrified. It had the smoke. It had the rock and roll. And he, he, would, he was storming out into the audience. I never wanted to get off the stage. I felt protected on the stage away from the people. Mike felt in his element down amongst the, the fans. And so if you saw how Mike performed – you'd understand why he was so popular. But he was very, very shy. Mike was very shy, and I don't think he ever got over this. The death of his sister changed Mike as a person. He loved his sister. She was also an athlete, too. But it changed him. And, and one of the closer bodybuilders to him was Rick Valente. Rick Valente is still down at Gold's Gym. Uh, I used to watch those two train with a little bit of envy because they, they were like brothers, and Robbie Robinson was their mentor. And I remember when Robbie Robinson won in Anaheim, I'm talking to Mike, man. How do you feel? And he's like, Robbie should have won because he, he witnessed the transformation Robbie went through. And we all wanted to be Robbie Robinson at one time. The and Mike Prince. came out from Matt. Yeah, Mike came out here and he's his friend, his training partner is the Black Prince. He's getting the ultimate in tutelage. Um, but of course, again, I, again, I think the WBF Federation changed a lot of bodybuilders image of or their perception of who they wanted to be. And I think that really, for me, was the beginning of the end of Mike because it took away the drive to get out there and promote himself as an individual. And that monthly check that came in made him more sedentary. And then when WBF was gone, I feel like something, a big void was gone for Mike because he couldn't get back into the IFBB's good graces and he couldn't pick up where he left off. I would be very curious to see how he spent the last 20 years of his life. I wasn't there for it, but there's a whole other chapter of his life that I'm not aware of. And I'm curious to hear it and and, and uh, he just kind of disappeared from the scene yeah Tarek you know um another thing about as we talk about his aggression and then talk you know having Sean talk about a side of him that I never bared witness to was the the, the shy withdrawn part you know I can identify that because I think most people who are really shy we're extroverts on stage you know I right. always knew when I walked outside my door I'm on display right and I have to become this flex wheeler, bigger than life guy. But I was never that guy. I was always pretending. I've always considered myself one of the world's greatest chameleons. But, you know, even you look at, you hear people like, uh, you know, like Prince, you know, very introverted person. But good gosh, man, let the camera turn it on. That's a whole Michael Jackson, monster. Same Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson, uh, all of those people like that. You know, they're tremendous performers and they're, perf they're just like, these beams of light that just attract you, you know, but, but they're truly activists. Like, like Sean said, I, I felt the same way. I felt comfortable on stage. I felt yeah. like, you know, if I glanced over downstage, that was like, like the unknown. And I would never stare into the audience. I would glance or glare into the audience. I would never lock on to one person because that was my safety zone. And I could do whatever I want up there, you know, but I was never that person. And I think a lot of, introverts are like that that's our force field of uh, uh, getting uh, uh staying protected and not hurt by other people one yeah. of the things i was really one of the things real quick Tarek, that i was impressed with mike was and a lot of people don't know this when mike was done you know he's from brockton massachusetts and uh, that's the home of the late marvin Hagler. and marvin Hagler had that great fight with uh tommy hearns one of the greatest three minutes in all of, of boxing the detroit he's out of detroit um but he was he was the guy that would walk, walk Marvin Hagler into the ring. Mike, Mike Quinn would go into the ring with Marvin Hagler. He's from that area. And you can actually probably find that on, on uh, YouTube. One of the things I remember, I was standing in line at the grocery store, and I picked up People Magazine because in it was a story about Mike Quinn. Mike Quinn was in some type of a fight. He actually, I think he got his jaw broken uh, or something. But he was in a fight with some big wig. You can maybe Google Mike Quinn, People Magazine, uh, fight or arrest. But it was – when you make it into People Magazine, like here I am in Muscle Fitness and Flex, no big deal. But you're in People Magazine. Um, Mike was a shy introvert, but let, don't get it twisted. He was in that boxing arena. He came from that boxing mentality. He brought that East Coast assassin attitude with him. He could, he could flip that switch, and you don't want to be – you don't want to be there because he's a fighter. And his track record kind of showed that in and out of a, a bodybuilding industry. Yeah. Um, you know, th this, this is awesome because uh, I didn't know uh, a lot of these things. I knew of his popularity. I knew how marketable he was. 
I did see his physique many times through the magazine as I, you know, uh, came up the industry. But I didn't know all this. I didn't know he was shy uh, off the stage. And I didn't know all those stories. But I want to thank you, Sean Ray, for always um, being the, the first guy to reach out to remember those that have helped us build this industry. And uh, they will never be forgotten for as long as I'm here with Olympia TV. We'll always honor those guys that paved the way for us to have an industry, for us to have a job. And I want to thank Mike Quinn for, for his effort, for his popularity, turning pro at the NPC USA in 1987, for entertaining the crowd, for inspiring many people. I'm currently in Brazil right now. And there's a friend of mine who owns supplement stores. His favorite bodybuilder was uh, Mike Quinn. And we call uh, Quinn here in Brazil because it was his favorite bodybuilder. His name is Marcelo mm -hmm. King, and he is the owner of Quality Nutrition uh, right here in Sao Paulo. So that goes to show you the um, how many people bodybuilding can reach. I want to thank you, yeah. Flex, for coming along and, and, and being always very sincere and raw. People love your, your, your sincerity and your honesty uh, on our lives. Guys, we are going here on 30 Minutes. This live has been about remembering Mike Quinn. We're going to finish with a few pictures of Mike Quinn. He was very marketable, huge biceps. He yeah. was on the cover of many magazines. He had the sunglasses. Um, and even in the end, he had his back. And um, we honor Mike Quinn. On behalf of the Mr. Olympia, the NPC, and the IFBB Pro League, we honor Mike Quinn today on this live. Thank you so much, Flex Wheeler. Thank you so much, Sean Ray. We will see you guys on the next live.